Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the 2020 Hot Topics in Environmental Law Lecture Series brought to you by the Environmental Law Center here at Vermont Law School. I'm Jenny Rushlow. I'm the director of the Environmental Law Center and associate dean for environmental programs. And I'm going to bring up a list of resources on the screen to direct you to some of the great programs at the Environmental Law Center for those of you looking to learn more. You can also view our full Hot Topics lineup by going to our website vermontlaw.edu backslash hot dash topics. Each of our Hot Topics talks is worth one Vermont CLE credit. So if you're looking to get that credit, keep track of which talks you attend for your records. We will have time for Q&A after today's presentation. So please, at any time during the talk, you can type your question into the chat box um, during the lecture and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the remaining time. Today, we are very pleased to welcome David Moraskin. David is the Pro Food Project Litigation Director with Public Justice in Washington, DC, and he focuses his practice on impact litigation to promote sustainable alternatives to the industrial animal agriculture system. His docket consists of constitutional, consumer, worker, and environmental cases. Of particular note, he's lead counsel in two of the AGGAG cases, a series of challenges to state laws that penalize investigations of factory farming. And in fact, just this week, he successfully struck down the North Carolina AGGAG law in federal district court. So it's a big week for David. <clears throat> David also represents ranchers, farmers, and consumers who are being exploited by corporate consolidation in the food industry. For example, he represents the nation's largest association of independent ranchers in suits concerning the advertising and labeling of beef. And he's counsel in two antitrust cases on behalf of poultry growers against Tyson and their integrators. David speaks regularly on legal and structural barriers to a more fair, transparent, transparent and equitable food system. And he's taught, um, he's taught previously, including as an adjunct at Georgetown University School of Law where he teaches on civil litigation. Before he was at Public Justice, David prosecuted Kui Tam litigation, um, served as the Alan Morrison Supreme Court Asso Assistance Project Fellow with Public Citizen, and he clerked for um, the Fifth Circuit. He graduated from Stanford Law School with distinction. He holds a master's from Oxford and a BA from the University of Chicago with highest honors. This is Professor Moraskin's third year in our summer program where he's teaching a course called Food Impact Litigation. And today he will present a talk titled Sick in the Slaughterhouse, Protecting Meat Industry Workers During the Pandemic and Beyond. Please join me in welcoming David Moraskin. Thanks so much for having me. You know, this is, I wish I was up in Vermont right now. It's, teaching at VLS is really one of my favorite things. I'm, I'm thrilled to get to spend some more time with some of the faculty and students for this talk and um, really get to know some of you all better. I'm gonna pull up a PowerPoint um, that will give you what we are going to talk about. Unfortunately, the topic, while really timely and important, is going to be very depressing. You know, as Jenny mentioned, at the beginning, the one of the areas we've been trying to think about how we focused on more and emphasize the nature of the food system around is uh, workers. And they've been one of the more difficult groups to represent legally. But I think, and what I'm gonna focus on here is how COVID really has demonstrated the importance of that work and how much more we need to do. And you know, what's odd about COVID is that, right, we're really, I guess three months, three and a half months into this process and there is just so much to relive. We really have gone through a whirlwind and particularly around the experience of workers in the slaughterhouse, which is where I wanna kind of begin to walk you through at the be for the first part of this talk. So as COVID begins to enter our field of vision, you know, possibly a little bit too late, but nonetheless, as it begins to enter our field of vision in March, um, food production immediately becomes 
part of the discussion. And the way I've ordered these slides, just so you can follow along, is they're roughly um, in time order from top to bottom. So as we go down towards the bottom of the slide, the month is progressing. So this is really at the beginning of March, right? We see two very interesting things happen. We see the first that because the pandemic is spreading around the world, that people are actually consuming less meat and therefore production needs to drop. There's doesn't, we don't need to be producing enough, the same amount of meat. Nonetheless, there's this increasing worry that the US is somehow gonna run out of meat and that we need to keep our slaughterhouses open. And so there's this pressure to continue production, to advance production, to make sure that we're not, our COVID doesn't impact our production methods. And of course, someone, pretty quickly realizes that, well, but if we're keeping our slaughterhouses open, there's a real risk for the spread of disease within the slaughterhouse. And what will that mean and what will that look like? And exactly as that's occurring, that's or as that kind of question is being asked, that's precisely what we start to see, the spread of COVID within the slaughterhouses. And, you know, April becomes a fairly traumatic month for the slaughterhouse industry and slaughterhouse workers, as I can't even fit it all in one slide, but we just get, you know, a increasing um, volume and distance of spread. So we get started in Colorado and move to South Dakota. And this is again in Colorado, we get a death. And then we get in um, Washington state, more tran more um, spreading slaughterhouses. And then we get more deaths. And this is time is it, it's in Iowa. And then we get a surge in South Dakota slaughterhouse COVID cases. So that the um, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Slaughter, Smithfield Slaughterhouse, Smithfield being one of the world's um, largest pork producers, becomes the nation's leading hotspot for COVID um, it, because we've allowed the sickness to spread through the slaughterhouse. It is, in fact, the largest rate of increase in the country in April, beyond New York or any of the other um, hotspots. And as the April progresses, we see just more and more and more of this as slaughterhouse workers get sick from COVID and nonetheless the slaughterhouses are keeping open and therefore we're getting more of a spread. Finally, about the um, last third of April, we do begin to see closures. We see closures in certain parts of the country. We see then people picking up on those closures and trying to reassess where we are. And then of course, we get the Trump administration and Trump himself um, intervening. And so at the very last day in April, the pre President Trump announces that he is going to issue an executive order that he claims is going to keep the slaughterhouses open, keep them from having liability from COVID, and you know force food production to continue. As we're going to discuss later in this presentation, that isn't actually true. He didn't actually do that. And unfortunately, some of us took him at his word, our mistake, and should have learned that lesson a long time ago. But um, nonetheless, that's what he claims he's going to do. And that claim in and of, it, of itself has an effect. And so, you know, by the beginning of May, slaughterhouses are continuing, those that would have closed are continuing to operate and we get, get more of a spread. We start seeing people talk about the um, reopening the slaughterhouses that have closed. And that becomes the, the theme that you know that we need to begin to produce meat again, regardless of the threat of illness. As May progresses, we find out that um, the meatpacking industry has been working with state officials to actually keep these headlines lower than what they are, that we in fact are um, not fully aware of the full extent of the spread, that these dramatic and heartbreaking headlines that I'm showing you are in fact an effort to, by the companies and state regulators to collude in keeping information from us that we need to know to keep our communities safe and to keep the workers safe. And nonetheless, though, we keep on having these plans stay open and spread continues. So where are we today? Right, so we still are having spread and yet in new places. So this is in Utah um, and elsewhere. We find out more and more that there's been this relationship between governor's offices, state health officials, potentially even the federal government and meat packers to hide information about what's going on in the slaughterhouses, to hide the nature of the risk that's going on. And then and then we keep them from to be able to make sure that they continue to operate at the same levels and so that they continue to profit. 
and possibly even most concerning today, we're seeing the exact same thing happen in other parts of the food industry. So as um, production spreads um, in the vegetable and fruit industry, as we get harvest season, we're seeing the exact same thing occur in other parts of the food food industry of workers being exposed in the fields, of workers being exposed in their dormitories, and that exposure just being considered acceptable by those in control of our system. And just to give you a sense of the overarching state of affairs, so this is a map. Leah Douglas, who's a reporter for the Food Environmental Research Network and Reporting Network, um, has done just an amazing amount of work uh, tracking all of the spread in the food industry that we've seen across the country. And so this is not all just from publicly reported data by health officials. Lee has gone out and read news sources and other um, area news to find out information. And as you can see, she has farms and ranches, processing plants, meat packing plants, and each time it's darker, there's more of a spread. And you can see this is from just about a week ago that I took this slide. and all the places in the country that it spread, all the places where we've seen really significant spread. And I encourage you to go to FERN and use this resource if you're interested in what's going on near you. So why did this happen? I think, you know, in terms of thinking about legal remedies and thinking in terms of thinking about policy solutions, we need to understand why we got to where we are. And one of the answers is just that in terms of how slaughterhouses are structured. So these are two photo, recent photos of US slaughterhouses that and how they operate. And this is just standard operating procedure. Workers standing shoulder to shoulder, inches apart, sometimes literally touching, um, to in order to process the meat. And this is because we allow these slaughterhouses to operate at such speeds that workers need to be this close and because there's an emphasis on profit over anything else. And so, right, how do you increase your profit? You increase your profit in part by reducing your overhead costs and you reduce your overhead costs by cramming as much into as small a space as possible. And that means you put workers next to each other if you need to. And so workers are standing close to on top of each other, breathing on each other, coming into con physical contact with each other. This is, you know, the exact type of circumstance that we know breeds COVID. Most importantly, of course, because this is all indoors. None of this is outdoor slaughterhouses. This is all inside where the air will be contained and breathed in. And the important thing to recognize, and this is actually a photo at the bottom of a Canadian slaughterhouse, but it's the um, same thing in U.S., is that this is not just true on the line. While workers will spend, you know, uh, they can, their shifts can be up to 11 hours and they will spend the vast majority of it on the line, there's no reprieve from that when they get off the line that this lunch area looks very similar to lunch areas at most U.S. slaughterhouses, crammed together, workers on top of each other, in each other's face, touching each other, you know, exactly the right conditions for coming into contact and contracting COVID. And the same is true in the hallways. The same is true in the bathrooms. In fact, slaughterhouses are reputed to have very few bathrooms, again, to reduce costs. And so that workers are waiting in line to go into the bathrooms or crammed in the bathrooms on short breaks. These are the prime conditions to spread COVID. And of course, we have a system in place in which the companies just don't care about their workers, right? This is a system that prizes profit over the individuals. And again, you don't need to take my word for it. Take Smithfield CEO's word for it, right? Who says that, right, its goal isn't about protecting its workers, that its priority is about production. That, you know, the um, right that he has to sit in his home and work from home, well, that's good for him, but it's not good for his workers. You know, that's not something that Smithfield should do to protect its workforce. And so this is an image from, um, a, I believe this might be a Tyson slaughterhouse, but it's the same that we've heard throughout the entire country. Rather than actually slow down the lines, rather than actually spread out their workers, the companies have instead put up these flimsy plexiglass barriers that clearly don't actually prevent the airflow from around the individuals, right? It's not like when someone breathes out in front of these uh, barriers that they're not, that that air is not going to get breathed in by the person next to them. There's no space in between them. This is all for show. And while these workers are wearing masks, in fact, what we've heard again throughout the country is that 
masks were one of the last things to be provider excuse me slaughterhouses were one of the last places to get masks you know they'll Smithfield and others declared, well, it's so difficult to get masks. But while we were all purchasing so at home masks or finding other ways to cover our mouths, Smithfield made no effort, as did the other companies, made no effort to provide those intermediate steps to these workers. We've heard as late as mid to late April workers being provided masks. Um, some in the kind of rare instance we've heard as late as early June workers being provided masks. And in addition, they're not taking basic steps to um, protect workers when they're coming in. Temperature checks were introduced very late. Even when they were introduced, um, the workers were encouraged to kind of stack together rather than spread out between a six foot line. Why? Because they wanted the workers to come in as fast as possible and have to worry about um, getting them, paying them for that time outside while they were waiting and spread out. The um, clock in clock out area has been an area that is well documented over the last few months to cause the spread of the disease because the company wants to force the workers through the clock in and particularly the clock out area as fast as possible so they clock out as fast as possible and that means that the clock in clock out area is not clean that there's um, congestion around that same with breaks we don't want to give any more breaks to these workers because god forbid that we have to compensate for time where they're not de the um de deconstructing an animal. And so workers' breaks have not been increased at all from what we've heard. Those breaks are about 15 minutes every three or four hours. And because the bathrooms and other facilities are placed far away from the floor, workers end up running literally to the bathroom, trying to take off their protective gear, put it back on to get back on the line and not be penalized. And so again, we see crowding, we see areas of contamination, all because these companies treat the workers as a secondary consideration to actually producing meat. And something to understand about this is that there's this kind of threat of running back to the line is part of a threatening culture that is endemic to these companies that the, all processing plants typically use it as a default in the country is the system of point systems. So basically if you miss a shift that you get a point and you, that's if you miss a shift for any reason. So you're sick, you need to take care of family, you want a vacation, it doesn't matter. You, you, do, you miss a shift, you get a point. You get up to X number of points, you can be fired. And so the culture of these places is of punishment unless you, if you don't show up. So you want to show up, you want to be on time, or you're going to be threatened regardless of the reason in which you don't show up. And so there's this pressure that's a part of the environment in which these people operate and that they play upon to encourage even sick workers to show up. And the um, photo on the side is from a lawsuit that we filed that I'll describe a little bit more later on, but it shows how the company is really built on this culture of fear that they have been generating for years. So what this is is a poster that was hung in the workplace that described a bonus that was being awarded. And what's really important in the translations at the bottom is from this fine print, you know, that you will get this bonus if you do not receive a single attendance point in the month of April. In other words, as long as you show up and as long as you don't have, as long as you show up and regardless of the reason you make sure that you're there, that even if you're there, even if you're sick, we'll give you a bonus. But if you don't, if you miss a, you miss work for even for having COVID, even for having a diagnosed test, even for having a fever. We're going to take away the bonus, and there's this culture which is going to punish you, and then it will lead to the potential of being fired if you show up, um, if you excuse me, if you take care of yourself or your family. And this is the way in which the companies used both the carrot and the stick to encourage sick workers to come into the slaughterhouse, increasing the spread. Something that we can't overlook in this whole process is the way in which race plays a very, um, it race is present. So right, this, um, the slide show them, the slide them have in front of you right now, this chart is shows the distribution of um, workers based on race within certain positions in the slaughterhouse. And essentially you can see that one of the only um, peaks of white workers is where they're supervising activities over, um, over um, people actually on the line, but the vast majority of people on the line are going to be people of color. And so this 
history of racial discrimination or racial dominance is something that is underlying and one might even suggest possibly part of the way in which these workers are treated as expendable and the reason for which these workers are treated as expendable. And, you know, just to give you another take on this, so this is um, JBS, again, one of the world's largest meat companies. This is their own data. So again, you don't need to take my word for it. You know, you can take their word for it. This is them trumpeting their diversity initiatives. But what's so interesting about it is if you look at their total workforce, there's not actually that great a number of white individuals. I mean, you know, it's this 21.5% is their total workforce. But if you look at their managerial workforce, the vast majority of managers, 57.6% are white. So you have this, you know, white culture saying to these minority workers who are on the line, these people of color workers who are on the line, excuse me, that are, that they are going to be expendable. And it's really hard to deny the way in which white supremacy is playing into this whole um, experience of workers. But of course, right, I don't think the companies are the only individuals to blame here. And I think the government has a large part of the burden to bear in all of this. They um, were very unclear about what were the rules that were supposed to be followed. So I have before you now, three different sets of guidelines, one from the White House, one from the Department of Labor, and one from the states. You know, what are the rules that we were supposed to follow? What are the rules that are supposed to be in place? What are people's rights? Who do you turn to? And we just did a really bad job as a society making that clear. And even within the um, guidelines themselves, they are remarkably unclear. So this is a picture on your right of CDC's guidelines for meatpacking workers this is the clearest statement CDC made about what is supposed to be true for meatpacking workers. And you can see that there's one thing that's bad, three things are that are good. You know, what is the, um, what is, what are, does that mean about the good stuff? You know, is that something that you need to do all of them? You need to do some of them? Um, I actually had to take out a tape measure to figure out that all the workers in the good line are spaced six feet apart. So it seems like it's cumulative. You add in the barriers and you do the spacing. But CDC didn't do that for me. I had to actually figure that out myself. And so the issue is, you know, we were just really bad at communicating what should have been done, what companies should be doing. Um, and just did not take a leadership role in this. And of course, you know, this is partially by design, right? As I mentioned, the Trump administration rolled out the this executive order saying that meatpacking companies needed to be open um, and that it was going to get rid of liability. Um, that is not what the executive order did. So the executive order was under something called the Defense Production Act. The Defense Production Act is shockingly about production. And so that it its main purpose is to encourage production. Every single legal authority that's ever interpreted the Defense Production Act has understood to be about contracting. So the idea is that um, if I am producing a good and I have a contract with Jenny um, to produce the good for her, but the government decides it really needs it, that I that the government can invoke the Defense Production Act and demand that I turn that um, that goods over to the government instead of Jenny, and Jenny can't sue. Me. That's the real point of the Defense Production Act. But the way Trump rolled it out was to say that this was what this administration does in terms of actually having legal justification or teeth. The other thing that's going on is that. You know, those agencies that are empowered to act just aren't doing so. So OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, is the agency that's most directly responsible for worker health and safety. And for the first part of this pandemic, it just was not doing anything. OSHA can issue guidelines um, for new health and safety risks, and it has steadfastly refused to issue one for COVID and how workplaces should be addressing COVID. In fact, it just defended itself before the DC Circuit when the AFL-CIO issued an emergency motion asking OSHA to issue a clear standard. and. Um, OSHA said it was going to rely on something known as its general duty clause. And OSHA can enforce worker health and safety standards under its general duty clause, but because it's operating under a general duty rather than a specific standard, it's not providing any guidance to um, 
to the workplaces for what they need to do. And worse still, for the first part of this pandemic, OSHA formally said it was not going to investigate. OSHA can only issue citations and can only act to enforce regulations against workplaces if it conducts investigations. And until um, earlier this month, OSHA was taking the stance that it was only going to investigate laboratories and other health-related facilities. So even though we were having these outbreaks at slaughterhouses, OSHA was affirmatively saying it was waiving its right to actually conduct any enforceable action. Even when um, OSHA acts, however, and this, as this is something to keep in mind now that OSHA has said it's going to conduct inspections, even when OSHA acts, it's incredibly understaffed and immensely slow. So while OSHA is now supposedly conducting inspections, and as you can see, this kind of for grand proclamation of 70% increase in inspections, it's a 70% increase over 14 inspections. 14 inspections that were done since March 16th, right? OSHA just does not have the resources, does not have the inspectors, and does not have the process in place to act quickly in a pandemic. You know, even when OSHA issues a citation, even when OSHA finds a violation after having done an inspection, the appeals process that OSHA has put in place can last literally a decade. Um, when we were working on these issues, the, as we were getting ready to file the suit that I'll describe to you, OSHA handed out down a decision in 2020 from a 2014 violation. You know, a lot of good that's going to do um, if in this kind of circumstance where we have a pandemic and people need to act quickly. And while I've used COVID to um, emphasize these problems. And I I do think the COVID really highlights a lot of these concerns. The one of the thing, primary things I want you to take away from this though is that this is not a COVID problem. This is a systemic problem about us failing to protect slaughterhouse and meat processing workers and treating them as extendable to put profit over people. And COVID's just highlighting this problem. But you know, these two images that I am showing you are of workers in um, poultry slaughterhouses. The woman on the left is suffering from the effects of repetitive stress injury. So in addition to the fact that um, these slaughterhouses are incubators and the lines move so fast they need to have people standing shoulder to shoulder, the slaughterhouses also, because the lines move so fast, cause people to make many, many of the same motions over and over and over again. Each person's assigned a specific type of cut, and that's all they do all day as meat whirls by them on the line. And so you get this circumstance where people are going to develop nerve system damage and have a problem with repetitive stress injuries and um, with their muscles. That could be treated if it was addressed quickly. These are typically reversible um, conditions. The problem is that so often we hear workers are sent back to the line until they don't have a problem, until they can no longer close their hands or move their arms. And at that point, it's no longer reversible. This woman will have lifelong disabilities because she's been sent um, she's been sent to a doctor too late. She will never be able to close her hands again because we allow her to be forced to make the same repetitive cutting motion over and over again and allow the company to disregard her medical needs. This gentleman on the right um, is has sliced off his fingers. And this is a very common problem, again, because the workers are so close together that they knives either cut yourself or you get cut by your neighbor. Um, another thing that we see regularly is that the workers are not given bathroom breaks. As I mentioned, uh, you're only given a 15 minute break a couple times a shift, maybe one 30 minute lunch break. And because this is a factory setup, you need to have a relief worker who's willing to replace you in order for you to go to the bathroom in order to save money. You, the companies have very few of these so-called floater workers, and so it can be hours before people go to the bathroom, which leads to people getting urinary tract infections. It leads to um, people wearing diapers on the line. We've heard of people urinating themselves and defecating themselves on the line because of this failure to um, failure to give them breaks. And all of this stems from the same disregard for the workers. Of course, a company that cared more about pro more about people than profit wouldn't allow this to occur. An agency that was willing to actually regulate wouldn't allow this to occur. The reason in part that we have so many problems with repetitive stress is OSHA's refused to regulate repetitive 
from stress. OSHA's bathroom break regulation just seems says that you need to have reasonable bathroom breaks. You know, quite a quite a clear and robust standard for our, your federal agency to be implementing while they know that people are wearing diapers on the line. So this is a problem, right? COVID highlights the problem here, but right, this is a problem that we need to address systemically and that will exist long after COVID. We, you know, this is, COVID's a time to take stock, but not to, um, not to forget about these workers. So what do you do about this? Um, so as Jenny mentioned in the beginning that, um, you know, I'm, I'm a litigator, I think in terms of lawsuits and we sued um, is what we did about it. Working with a group called Towards Justice and the Heartland Center for Jobs and Freedom, we represented an organizing group and its workers against Smithfield, this pork processing company in Missouri. You know, this was at the time in which um, the OSHA was saying that it was not actually going to conduct inspections. And so there didn't seem like there was a, um, a different opportunity for redress. And so we looked to the common law. We looked to the traditional rules of law that govern all of our relationships and said, this just can't be right. There have to be violations of people's rights and of the company's duties. And so we brought two different kinds of theories. One was a public nuisance theory, and one was a something that sounded in negligence or the right to a safe workplace. So public nuisance is the concept that you can operate your property in certain ways, but if it creates a generalized risk to the public that is a is causing the risk of health or safety, then people who are especially exposed to that can sue. And so this comes from um, places where companies would build kind of breeding uh, ponds that would breed flies and other vectors for disease that would then get into the community. And we thought, you know, COVID's not that dissimilar. If you're going to um, have workers who are gonna expose one another and you're gonna force workers to come into that contact and then send them out into the community, you are exposing the broader world and creating a public nuisance. And certain states also recognize this idea that employers have a responsibility to create a safe workplace and that can that can be enforced not just after the fact through damages but prospectively to ensure that the workplace is safe and that is true in Missouri and we also said right something that a safe workplace is one that does not um, involve the spread of disease so we sued Smithfield in district court and um, sought a preliminary injunction Unfortunately, that case was dismissed. It was dismissed because what the court said was, this is really for uh, OSHA to act upon. It is for OSHA to, um, you, should, you should seek redress before OSHA and then come back to me. You know, but one of the positives, and I think an example of how litigation can protect individuals, um, even if you don't succeed in court, is because of the attention that this brought to bear and because Smithfield needed to be able to not look ridiculous before this judge, we got a variety of changes and put in place that um, even without the, getting an order from the court. So, you know, Smithfield had to report to the judge what it was doing. And, you know, within days of us filing lawsuit, the lawsuit, there was a plan to change crowning around the um, clock in, clock out area. A new tent was added to the lunchroom to create space. We've heard that since then there's been a more sick leave available, that there's been more spacing for when people are getting temperature checks. So you can create change by seeking to enforce these rights, even though the court found that someone else here, OSHA, need to be our first um, area to go to. The other thing that I think is really nice about this lawsuit is that it's become a model for others to follow. And thankfully others have not kind of suggested that they can just, just throw up their hands and um, turn things over to an agency that's enacting or is, is not acting, excuse me. So, you know, a series of McDonald's workers filed a similar suit in Illinois and that judge um, said that it was not going to defer to OSHA, that the judge was going to act on the case, and we're waiting for the preliminary injunction hearing there based on the exact same two theories. Um, another case on behalf of Amazon workers is pending in the Eastern District of New York, exact same two theories, and we're hoping that courts will recognize that if OSHA is not actually acting, if OSHA doesn't have any standards, that they do have a role. And thankfully so far, this Missouri case, while creating a model, the actual decision has also been treated as an outlier. What else can we do? So, you know, building off that, 
Missouri case, you know, something that we should all be looking to do is hold OSHA to account. That judge in Missouri actually gave us a really good idea in deferring to OSHA. He said, you know, there's this statute that seems to suggest that you can take OSHA to court if it fails to correct emergent health effects. And so, well, that statute's only been cited in two cases ever. Um, one is our case in Missouri and one is in a, another case just to say it exists. You know, I really hope that advocates start looking at the statute and start taking this judge at his word and saying, you know, if OSHA is not going to act and courts are going to defer to OSHA, we can take OSHA to court for failing to act and force it to act if it's going to be arbitrary and capricious. Something else that I think we know as advocates we need to start really thinking about is how we make damages meaningful. So most workers' suits are forced into this regime known as workers' compensation, which um, is an administrative remedy that presets the damages that um, workers can get for being ill in the workplace. Historically, there have been exemptions to that regime for intentional or reckless misconduct like we've been seeing in this COVID world. Um, unfortunately, the state courts have kind of taken away that exemption. But where we have such disregard for human life and well-being, you know, it's I think maybe time to try to really force legislatures and the courts to reevaluate this exemption. And in kind of the extreme cases where people have lost life, lost the life of their family members, had incurred a massive um mass and medical bills, you know, we really need to make an example of these companies and make them feel the consequences of that so they will behave differently in the future. Right? The point of damages are not just for compensation for the individuals, it's to defer conduct. And we need to get to a point where these, where workers' comp is not a barrier to that, and that workers can, in fact, enforce their rights so that they can deter this conduct in the future when this is faced again. On the flip side of that, the um, Something else we need to kind of be aware of is as we push for these forms of remedies, as we push to deter conduct, the industry is working just as hard on the other side. And we've seen in Missouri, um, the, one of the Missouri congressional delegation members introduced legislation to protect uh, meatpacking plants from suit after we filed our suit. Um, the Senate is taking up immunity legislation as we speak. And so we also need to be kind of wary of this company pushback, the use of these, the use of our efforts to protect workers, of our efforts to put personal health and safety above corporate profits, and by and companies taking that and saying, running to the legislature and saying they need protection. Those will be long-term problems, and we need to kind of keep an eye on that and make sure that, that doesn't come into fruition. As I mentioned in the prior slide, you know, one of the other things that we've really seen to be successful is coupling our work with the media. So the media has been truly wonderful in covering the story. It continues to get a great deal of attention. The reporters have been passionate and careful and thoughtful about their presentation and also really dug into these issues. And that has been so far the best way to get change. So work with community groups on the ground who are hearing workers' stories, help elevate them to the media, and have the media tell those individualized stories so that we can get change in the workplace. And that's been a real kind of success story in this. The other um, success story, and possibly the only good thing that I think is gonna come out of all of this, wow. is what we've seen is a real energizing of worker organizing and worker power. Um, in, we, these are workers who are, as I described, historically disenfranchised. Many of them are refugees who are being placed in these workplaces by the Refugee Resettlement Office. And therefore, they've fled their home country, have come here, and are being told by our government this is where they have to work. Right? These are not workers that have historically felt empowered to rise up against their employer and express their rights. But in COVID, because of the extreme conditions, we've seen that begin to occur. We've seen um, protests being organized at slaughterhouses by the workers. We've seen workers being willing to file suit when they've been afraid in the past. We've seen workers speaking to the media where they've been afraid of the exposure. And so, you know, for a long term good, I think where we really need to put our efforts is to encouraging and helping and aiding those um, community groups. You know, the Rural Community Workers Alliance, which is our client group in um, Missouri, is a one person shop. Um, it's, it's literally one gentleman, Axel Fuentes, who does all the organizing of these workers at the Smithfield plant and in the surrounding community. And he was able to get meaningful change and protect those workers' lives. Think about what he could do with two people. And, you know, I think this is a time for us to kind of reinvest in those groups. 
Finally, I've got to plug my own organization. So the Public Justice Food Project has a variety of ways in which you can get involved. You can sign up for our newsletter. We are really looking to connect with attorneys and help um, work with attorneys in local communities, help give them advice, find ways to network with them and um, find ways to team up with them. So both if you're an attorney, you can sign up for the attorney network. If you're not an attorney, you can just sign up in our newsletter. But I really um, encourage you to kind of see what we're doing and see ways that we can work together. And that is my summary, a very quick overview of the state of COVID and on um, slaughterhouse workers and its um, potential legal and uh, legislative um, remedies. I'm, hopefully you guys will have some questions. Um, I'll be answering them with Jenny, but if you don't, if you want to write me separately, this is all my contact information for how to reach me. Great. Thank you so much. That was really interesting talk and obviously an issue that's been in the news a lot lately. Um, so I'm sure people have been hearing about it in popular media. First question, um, you talked about a public nuisance suit and um, with lots of torts cases, there is a challenge of showing that the harm that was caused um, can be traced back to the person that you're being, that you're holding liable. So in this case, was there, was there a need as part of a public nuisance lawsuit to show that the COVID infections for sure happened at the or were being spread at the meat plant? Um, couldn't couldn't it have been caught elsewhere? How did you address that? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. And um, one of the important things to um, one of the important things that we should uh, emphasize about these cases and the way in which they uh, way in which the companies have taken advantage of them is the nuisance suits that have gone forward so far have not sought damages. So we haven't needed to actually um, bring, uh, to prove that sense of causation, we've been, we've had to um, instead just show that there's a potential for future harm. And that's how we've gotten the, around that causation problem. We And so what happened was in most of these states where you got stay at home orders, you got people, um, this governors saying that failure to comply with the CDC guidelines was itself a public nuisance. So you got public nuisance per se. And then all we would need to show is that the companies were failing to comply with the guidelines. And that would lead to forward looking relief. We didn't need to kind of prove that backward looking damages. I will say in Missouri, one of the things that was true was the court was really concerned about the absence of infections. That's one of the things he emphasized in his um, dismissal order. What was so concerning there, and I hope is a lesson for others going forward, both in the judiciary and elsewhere, is as soon as he dismissed us, Smithfield began testing at the plant. And um, you got the you got a demonstration that, in fact, there was spread at the plant. So the stay-at-home orders were right. You need to follow the CDC guidelines. If you don't follow the CDC guidelines, you will get spread. And hopefully that is a kind of piece of information we can carry forward to other courts elsewhere. Okay, great. Thank you. And I should have mentioned initially um, to folks that if you're watching on our website live stream, you can add your question by clicking on the video and you'll see a chat box on the right side where you can add your question. Or if you're watching on our Facebook live stream, you add your question to the comment box below. And we'll try and get to as many questions as possible. So please do submit your questions that way. Next question. Um, you talked a little bit about the refugee status of some of the workers and um, imagine that that there's also other immigration issues um, in the in the farm worker context. There's a lot of challenges because it's so um, heavily dependent on immigrants for the workforce. A lot of challenges around reporting um, work hazards for fear of deportation um, and what what are the reporting options for these slaughterhouse workers and do you see these you know the cumulative impacts of all of the various risk factors that these people are facing as as having an effect on that yeah so great question and i definitely think it has an effect right this is a, there's a huge deterrent effect towards people being willing to come forward um one of the great one of the 
only good things about OSHA, given my presentation, but a, certainly a good thing, is that OSHA will allow you to make confidential complaints and keep your name quiet um, out of the system, and they need to protect that. And there are whistleblower protections if that were to actually um, come become public. And so there is um, that option under OSHA for you to present yourself. I, in our Missouri case, too, we were able to proceed as a Jane Doe. Um, so the worker who came forward never revealed her name. And that was challenged by Smithfield, I think, as a form of intimidation in order to prevent other workers from coming forward. Um, their argument was that um, they needed to know what biases she had in order to prosecute the case. It's very unclear to me how a worker's biases um, could at all impact the existence of social distancing or not. Those are facts within Smithfield's control. Similarly, um, the ability, a worker's bias against the company has nothing to do with the fact that there's, whether there's a mask or not. Um, that, so that is an argument Smithfield raised. We were able to prevail there um, that we were able to keep her identity confidential. And so that's another way you can protect workers. It's not foolproof um, for sure, right? There are these challenges, but that's another way you can do this. Um, obviously, another option is to choose your plaintiff very carefully, right? You want to make sure that whoever you're putting forward is not going to be exposed. And, you know, I think that goes back to my organizing point that we really want to empower these worker groups on the ground so that there's a more than one individual who's um, willing to step forward and have their name associated with something. Mm -hmm. Are there any unique protections for refugee workers in terms of um, international law or human rights? You know, that, that's an interesting question, not my area of expertise, I will say. Um, but I would think my point about the refugee workers was that it's a there's an intimidation about coming forward. I actually don't think that they will be at risk. Um, right, they should, they're placed by the Refugee Resettlement Office, they're here on a, a legal status, um, right? It's about the ways in which these companies structure their workforce to prevent workers from being feeling the ability to advocate more than there's a direct legal risk. Um, you know, I, but I will say I am definitely, you should uh, ask someone who's a more of an expert in international and refugee law than I am. You, um... I know the topic that you talked about today was different from the case that you recently litigated, but um, that, you know, that is something that was celebrated in the news and just uh, a happy coincidence that we happen to have you in front of us today. And congratulations on that. Do you have any lessons learned from that successful litigation um, in North Carolina that you could share with other advocates in terms of legal strategy? So I, a couple of things, um, you know, the ag-ag litigation has been a really important example of coalitions working very functionally and healthfully together. So, right, the same group of attorneys and organizations have been fighting these cases across the country, and it's a really good example of um, utilizing one another's resources together for a shared end. So PETA, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, Center for Food Safety, um, have been consistent allies in this fight. And really we paired it well with the media groups, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press um, have really been wonderful in aiding in this entire process. And so I think it's a really good example of how groups can kind of come up with a shared end and work together. Um, I also think it's a good example of how um, industry pushes back. So we, the North Carolina law took five years to strike down. And it took five years to strike down because we were successful in Utah and Idaho and having their ag, ag laws struck down. So what happened was those statutes were originally about falsifying your employment applications, which is so plainly speech, it's not funny, right? That employment application involves writing, involves speaking. Um, the ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council and the Chamber of Commerce thought they were gonna be really creative and um, get around the First Amendment by making it about false speech. And thankfully, after we uh, after we filed suit, the Supreme Court's decision Alvarez came down, which made clear that false speech is protected. So once we won those cases, they re they redid the statutes to try to hide their motives and try to hide the speech elements of them. And so, right, I think, you know, as advocates, we need to recognize that our work is part of a dialogue and exchange and we can't let it go after one win. So, right, had we abandoned the field after um, Idaho and Utah, right, we would have basically enabled these companies to have 
um, the same effect in a more damaging way. The North Carolina law is in fact broader than the Idaho and Utah laws and that it covers all industries and not just agricultural industries, even though it was motivated by the desire to protect agricultural industries. And so, um, you know, I think one thing is that this is a long-term play. I do think, however, this is, you know, the way to North Carolina is really important to emphasize in that it will hopefully encourage workers to come forward, right? The, what we, what North Carolina did was it penalized any worker who wanted to expose a, pub, a risk to the public, regardless of what that risk was. So if you went out of your way to get evidence of risk at the workplace, be you an undercover investigator or just a regular Joe worker, and you wanted to warn the public about that, you were gonna be liable under North Carolina's law. And I think what COVID shows is that, right, we can't have laws like that on the books, that we need to have a way in which um, workers can warn the public about severe risks. And thankfully, North Carolina District Court recognizes that there's a First Amendment right to do so. It's um, motivating, I think, for our students in particular to hear about that because you know we have we have a lot of students that come to Vermont Law School with an interest in sustainable agriculture. But it's it's so interesting to hear you talk about you know you've had to rely on um, First Amendment claims and tort claims and worker protection standards, employment law, um, so many different not not to mention you know media work and and non litigation strategies to to get at the end goal of trying to improve the food system. Um, and that's that's something that I hope motivates our students when they're, you know, they really want to do ag work, but they're sitting in torts or constitutional law that can really, there's so many pieces of it. And I mean, most people I don't think have to be expert in so many areas of law as you, but um, it's inspiring to see how you've mastered it. Um, well, that's really yeah. our model as you know, is about thinking, right, there's, we need to kind of, we are up against a big foe in ACT and a very well-funded foe. And you need to kind of think outside the box because if you're just doing the same cases, they'll, they they have a tool book to respond and legislators who are on call to do their bidding. And so, right, kind of thinking about new ways to challenge things is really important. Could you speak a little bit about that in terms of foes? Because as, as I was, you know, sharing your bio with people, you, you work with farmers and ranchers in some cases, and yet, you know, I know the Farm Bureau has been a formidable opponent in ag-gag cases. So um, how is it that you navigate those relationships um, with farmers and ranchers on the one hand while you're suing? Um, I mean, you're not suing the Farm Bureau, but they sort of, they, they, they hear it that way when you're suing um, about ag-gag laws. Sure. Yeah. And um, our view, the Farm Bureau, particularly in North Carolina, doesn't represent farmers. The Farm Bureau in North Carolina and Arkansas and other places represents industry. You know, I think what we need to recognize is that agriculture has is no longer about the land. It's about, um, you know, corporate profiteering just the same way that the robber barons were, just the same way oil and gas is, just the same way that, you know, Microsoft and Amazon are, right? I mean, this is not a agriculture in the United States is controlled by a handful of companies who answer to their shareholders, not to the environment, the animals, the land, or the workers. And so if we're going to you know, representing farmers is in fact about challenging that system because they're being exploited just as much in many instances as the animals, land, and workers. And so, you know, it's all part of the same system in our mind and one that needs to be deconstructed so that we can really think about how to do things differently or else we're going to lose our ability to use our land and lose our ability to have healthy food. Thank you. Well, it's just about time to wrap up, but before I do, I wonder if you would have any suggestions for our listeners that are feeling particularly motivated to um, share their resources when it comes to mitigating the impacts of COVID and particularly for um, Black workers and the Black Lives Matter movement. Do you have any suggestions for organizations that um, you find to be particularly impactful? Yeah, so there's a wonderful organization called the Food Chain Workers Alliance, which works um, with these group, where it's a, basically an umbrella organization for on-the-ground groups like the Rural Community Workers Alliance, who we represented in Missouri, and um, a wonderful group in Arkansas, Ben Ramos, which is representing poultry workers. Um, the HEAL Food Alliance, which is the Health Environment 
um, Agriculture and Labor, I had to make sure I got that right, Alliance, is a BIPOC-led organization as is Food and Water, sorry, as is Food Chain Workers Alliance. And um, they really are advancing these issues and thinking about them and their intersectionality. And so I recommend you were, you know, go to their resources and websites and speak with them. They're great groups and, you know, deserve your time, energy, and money. Thank you. Well, that was an extremely um, timely talk. And thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. And um, for everybody that joined us, thank you for being with us today. Um, our next Hot Topics talk will be on June 23rd, and we hope that you can join us then. Thanks, everyone.